Morning. Good morning. Welcome morning. to this gathering window Christian Church. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Glad that you have gathered on this day and glad to see all of you on Zoom and on Facebook Live. We're really glad to have you with us this day. Again this week, I heard from somebody who joins us on Facebook and said thank you. So welcome, welcome everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about giving God everything. What do you think about that? Giving God everything. I'm I remember standing on a on a playground and Wally Tatum uh, threatening me if I didn't give him my lunch money. <laughs> I remember, well, it, it's very different to give Wally Tatum my lunch money than to give God everything. If you trust the love of God, then giving God everything makes perfect sense. In fact, might be the best option. But if you really, if we really don't trust the love of God, then it, we would hold back, right? We would say, I might know better how to do this than than God. So let's talk about giving God everything this day. And I'm just glad to be here among the people who have decided here and around the world in lots of places and languages and cultures that we want to pause and ask Jesus to reinvest in our lives, to be alive again in us and us follow Jesus as Lord. We meet here as Christians. And so let's welcome one another this day. Let's share a welcome. It's there in the bulletin. Welcome, all who are here. Welcome. Love you guys. Greetings, greetings. Welcome, my physical, mental, and spiritual self to this moment. Welcome. Welcome, spirit of the risen Christ among us. Welcome. Together, we willingly enter communion one with another. Welcome. Let's sing, come and fill our hearts. share a call to worship this morning. God has given us breath to live and spirit to sing. Thanks be to God. God has gathered us into a community of care and worship. Let us worship God with love, thanksgiving, and praise. So come to our hymn of praise, All My Hope on God is Founded. I do want to encourage you, I didn't mention earlier, to have uh, with you where you are at home or even watching it later recording something to be your bread and your cup because we invite everyone present to take part in communion with us this, this day. Let's sing our hymn of praise.
we do come to you this morning because there's really nowhere else to go. We may think we're going other places when we run from you. We may think we're taking control when we rebel against you. But in reality, all of those days, those ideas, those choices happen within you. You are the one in whom we live and move and have our being. You are the one whose love and choice brought us into existence. So help us to flee from the illusion, from the pride that helps us think we can be without you or do better than you have plans for us. But we come this day to praise you. We come to you because it's the only place to be, but it's the place we choose to be. We want to be in your love and in harmony with your love. And so we offer you the praise of song. We offer you the praise of prayers lifted up in voice and in heart. And we offer you the praise of our very lives. Please help us understand that all of our singing, our giving, our acting is in vain if it's done to buy something back, to win back a love that we never had to earn in the first place. So help us to be reminded that salvation is not of works or we'd have something to boast about that our salvation is a gift from you, as is our very lives. And so we offer you the praise that you desire, which is our love, our dedication, our sincere gratitude, and the commitment of our very lives, words, and deeds, and resources, so that we might be part of you building in us and through us the world you would have us to live in. So help us to praise you with the sincerity and the beauty that you desire from us. And help us to become the people who not only say words and voicing the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, but we become the ways in which this prayer is fulfilled. Inhabit by your spirit this prayer as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I used my children's sermon at the beginning. I was going to talk about Wally Tatum. And uh, we're being asked to give our everything today, but not our everything to some vague idea, but to some concrete, to a concrete reality that can embrace us all and will teach us all how to love one another. May we give ourselves freely to God this day. Let's look at our, our prayer requests. There's a list printed in the bulletin that. Glenn faithfully sends us each week. And um, I didn't have my normal time on Wednesdays. Wednesday, I was in the woods. Um, that's why I'm smiling more today. Uh, but um, I did talk to Barbara Jennings. She's still uh, looking for surgery. And a lot of surgeries are getting delayed because they're having to prioritize surgeries a lot. And so be praying with, with Barbara uh, that that the, it'll come time for her to have her surgery, which can get her legs to healing faster. The good news is when she went back this past Wednesday, um, her wounds are still improving some, but it's very long and slow progress. I, I told her she is the uh, poster child of perseverance and, and hanging in there. Um, and I know she gets discouraged from time to time, so pray for her heart and her soul, but she's also very brave 
and I'm just glad to know her. And you probably get cards from her. She has a ministry of sending cards, and we're grateful for Barbara. Are there other updates or additions to the prayer list? Gay Nail? Okay. Okay, Cree, um, Cree is having a scan on Monday, tomorrow, and we also want to pray for Seth Washburn, grandson of Linda Washburn, who's still struggling with the effects of COVID. George. Yep. Okay. Mark. Uh huh. Mm hmm. That'd be great. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Candace Tongue is out of the hospital, but is under the care of hospice at her daughter's house. She's repeating it so folks online would know. Um, all right. Yeah, Ben. Right. Yep. Sure. Ben's wanting us to pray for the folks impacted by the um, the incident at the, at the concert. Yeah. Yeah, and we've got friends in Houston too. So we'll be praying. For Anybody else? Yeah, gay nail. Okay, praying for Deb Murray, whose father passed away. Yeah, Glenn. Okay, we'll pray for Lynn Lake, who's going to be going to the pain clinic. We pray that they'll be able to give her the relief she desires. Love you, Lynn. George. Yep. Journey is doing is out of the hospital and doing well now. Who was that? Journey. Okay, Journey. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Anybody else? All right. We'll enter into a time of silent prayer, and then I'll voice a prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, in our own hearts, we have voiced prayers without words. But the deepest prayers are prayers we can't put words on. Sometimes we can just dance with joy because good things are occurring. Sometimes we sit in silence and in agony as we go through hard times. But your heart is with us. You dance with those who dance and you mourn with those who mourn. And you invite us to do the same. So we are with one another through the victories and the defeats, through the days of health and through the days of sickness. And so we want to be your people together. We not only want to lift in prayer 
people that are on our hearts and on your heart. But we wish for you to move us by your Holy Spirit to minister to people, to be the answer to prayers prayed, as well as the ones who voice them. So now be with us, fill us with your spirit, and answer the deepest prayers of our lives that we might today be committed to you and be more secure in your love and your spirit than any day in the past. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We come now to the communion, to the Lord's Supper, and we invite everyone here and everyone who's watching and listening now and later to take part in communion. In addition to any way the Lord might speak to you as we take the bread and the cup this day, reminding us of God's love and grace, I would like us to be reminded that when the early church gathered and took the Lord's Supper, many of them knew the very threat of of losing their property because of being faithful to Christ, being dragged out and, and executed um, as martyrs, and yet they would take communion. They understood in a way that we can't because we enjoy the freedoms of having pews to sit in and places that are air-conditioned and heated and preachers who get to be told you're a preacher in public without a threat. We don't understand often that communion was early on in the people who changed the Roman world, an understanding that you had given your everything to Christ when you took the bread and the cup, because everything was at stake. And that you had been abandoned in many cases by family and by countrymen. And you had come into a fellowship in which the, the people that gathered with you and took the bread and the cup were the people you could depend on in a world that was not dependable. And so in the way that God reminds us of his love and grace, may this be a day when we're also reminded that in taking the bread and the cup, it is us saying to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are with you and to the church of Christ, every one of us together, we are committed to one another in a way that can only be understood through a cross and a resurrection, through a servant and a washing of feet, as Christ showed us that way. We invite you to communion, and let's sing our hymn of communion. Yesu, fill us with your love. <clears throat>
Betrayed, Jesus took the bread and broke it, said, This is my body broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Our elder Marty Greer will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful for your abiding presence. We remember the love that surrounds us as we partake of the wine in memory of Jesus. May your Holy Spirit be within and among us. Help us, O oh God, to be instruments of your love as we drink this wine from this communion table. And let us dedicate ourselves more fully to serving you and others during this coming week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the same way he took the cup and blessed it and said, this is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Take it. Amen. As we come each Sunday to a time of offering, it's a time when we not only recognize that the source of everything we are, everything we have is God, it's when we dedicate a portion of what we have received in our service, the way we serve the church and the people who have gathered here early this morning and put things together, we say thank you. We serve. In fact, there are plenty of people who understand you tithe your time as well as your resources. But we also uh, recognize that we set aside a portion of our resources to support the life of this church, to pay the bills, and to keep things rolling as we meet together and serve the Lord. And we also participate in the bigger church of Jesus Christ as we support work in our own area, our own country, and around the world. And so we say thank you to the Lord for everything and to the faithful for being part of what God is doing in the world. Amen. Let's sing the doxology together. If you would like to follow along in the Pew Bible, or if you're at home and you want to follow in your own Bible, we're reading from Mark 12, verses 38 through 44. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplace and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a shadow, for, and for a show, make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw, the large, threw in large amounts. 
but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out their wealth, out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Thank you, Gaynell. I want to talk about giving God everything. How much is included in everything? Man, I don't know who you give everything to, but uh, the question today is, will we give God everything? And I have to admit, I'm, I'm a little tenuous about telling what I think this passage actually says. I would rather go along with what I often hear said based on the giving of the widow, uh, but I honestly don't think it's faithful to what Mark intended. So I'd like to lead up to the passage. And I want to tell you at the end, it'll be, it'll be positive and I hopefully joy filled as we get to the end of the message. But in the middle, I promise, uh, at least for me, it was very uncomfortable. I was in a bit of a funk yesterday thinking about the sermon. Um, Tammy was asking me what's going on. I really didn't want to start talking about it uh, because this sermon did a number on George. In chapter 12 of Mark, leading up to this passage, Jesus is in the temple. He's right there in the center of everything that is happening. He's right there in the midst of the people who had turned the house of prayer into a den of thieves. Remember this. He's right in the middle of the people who he is telling this is going to be destroyed. The temple will not have one little stone stacked on itself. It is going to be totally destroyed, and you brought it on yourself. In chapter 12, he has said that the, that the cornerstone has been rejected, and he's talking about himself, the Messiah, the Christ being the cornerstone. And he says that in this cornerstone, the eternal dwellings will be built. In other words, if you want to know how God wants things to be built, you build them on Jesus Christ. You build them on the one who shows us the ways of living, that when you live that way, it actually works for everyone, not just for some, but for everyone. Then they tried to trap him in chapter 12. Should we pay the imperial tax? This is not a tax for citizens who get all the benefits of being Romans. This is for the Jews. In fact, when Quirinius was governor, they took a census. You remember that in the story of Jesus' birth? Because they want to make sure they get taxes out of every single person that needed to pay the taxes, and it was not a fair tax system. And on top of that, the tax collectors like Zacchaeus would collect extra for their own pockets. It was a terrible thing to pay that tax. They hated it, and they hated everyone associated with that tax. And they asked Jesus, should we pay the tax? And Jesus wanted to be clear what he was talking about. He was not talking about nationalism. He was not talking about nationalism, Jewish nationalism, nor Roman nationalism. He was talking about the kingdom of God that it includes everyone. So he said, whose image is on that coin? Caesar. Well, you just give Caesar what's Caesar's. Give God what is God's, and what is God's is everything. Well, then he goes on. They trap him, they think. This guy dies, and his widow is left, and then she marries his brother, and he dies, and he marries his brother, and he dies. He ends up marrying seven brothers. Who's, who's uh, the husband when you get to the, to the next realm? And Jesus is saying, what? I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm paraphrasing. What are you guys messing with? Why is that the question? Don't you get it? When we're resurrected, when we're up and alive in the new life, there's Marriage is, is a construct for who play, how you play favorites, because you have to play favorites, right? You understand Tammy gets more of my favoritism than anybody else? You understand that, right? That's not only for my self-defense. It's, it's just the right way it ought to be. But, but that's the way it is. You have to play favorites. So we've got a, we've got a way where you get married. We've got that, that in it. But I want you to understand, when God gets everything God wants, you're going to take care of people who aren't your wife and aren't your mother and aren't your grandmother 
and aren't even related to you. You're going to walk into a fellowship and you're going to take care of everybody there as if they were your mama, your widow, your orphan. And then somebody is insightful. I think a spiritually led Pharisee, scribe, catches on that Jesus is really getting it, and he's getting it too. And he says, tell me, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, body, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. And this scribe says, I think you're right. You're right when you say love God with all your heart, soul, body, mind, strength, love your neighbor yourself. And Jesus turns to that scribe and says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, this is a scribe that gets it. That's actually looking for the spiritual insights that are coming through the Messiah, the Christ. And then, then he messes with David. Because everybody hopes that what David's heir does, this Christ that comes as part of the lineage of David, is not a spiritual Messiah doing what Jesus is actually doing. They want him to be a military person like David and kill people, be known for killing thousands rather than hundreds. Because you remember, that's how David rose above Saul. He killed thousands rather than hundreds. And then Jesus says, why is it then that the Lord is, that David's Lord is called his Lord? And this Christ that you're looking for is David's Lord. In other words, this is a lordship above king, above nation. It's a lordship. And make sure you understand that the people who heard it, it says there in Mark chapter 12, they knew he was talking about them. Because he tells the parable, this man had a vineyard, and he put some people in charge of the vineyard, and he sent some servants to collect his part, and they, they beat him and sent him off. Then he sent another one, and they beat him, and they sent another one and beat him. He said, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll send my son. If I send my son, they'll respect my son. And they killed the son. And in Mark, it says, they knew he was talking about them. Because you know what they wanted to do to, them, to Jesus? What they did, they wanted to kill him. So that's what Jesus has been saying right before he says what Gaynell read. Watch out for these teachers of the law. They love to be important. In those places where religion and politics matter, they want to be important. But they devour widows' houses. And then this widow gives everything to them. The widow gave everything she had to live on to the ones who will devour her house. An unjust system told that widow, if you do this, you'll be in right relationship to the God who made the system that will devour your house. And she was faithful. You understand? She is a picture of faithfulness. She is a picture of faithfulness to someone trapped as a victim in a system that is unjust. And the disciples got it. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and all God, and they killed him for saying that. That's why it can make him nervous to say what Jesus actually says. Because the people who think poor people who are poor deserve to be poor, and rich people who are super rich and on the backs of the poor are supposed to be super rich on the backs of the poor are anti-Christ. You hear me? I don't like to have to say it because sometimes it's me, and that's why I was in such a funk yesterday. Sometimes I would prefer to be the favorite in an economic system where I get more while others get more. So, first off, we must look at who has our loyalty and the resources we control. You don't need to worry about the money you don't have or the words you don't get to speak or the actions you don't get to take. I only want us to consider the words we get to speak, the actions we get to take, and the way we consume resources and spend our money and use our money. Okay, so don't, I want you to be responsible for anyone else other than ourselves. That's, what do we do? And then the question Jesus would come and say, do you do the greatest commandment while you're doing it? Who are you loving when you speak words? Who are you loving when you do the things you do? 
Who are you loving when you spend the way you spend and consume the way you consume? Is it just you that you're loving? Is it just the people closest to you? Or are you part of the kingdom of God when you do your loving and your speaking and your that's the question I heard God asking George. You see, see, I don't want to, I'm not qualified for this sermon, except that I've called to preach it. I'm not saying I do with my words and actions and money exactly what needs to be done. I am saying that I understand what Jesus is saying here. And I like my robe. And I like, I like being here. You understand? I like getting to be the preacher. And one way you stay the preacher is you don't say what Jesus said. A lot of people stay the preacher by telling people to give to them and their ministry sacrificially while they fly around on jets and live high on the hog and don't help the poor, except in ways that are showy. Pay attention. They do it in ways that are showy, but they accumulate huge wealth. Jesus was talking to those people. I don't like talking to those people. I would prefer just to be nice and peaceful and go along until I do what I did yesterday, which is take the time to get in a funk if you need to be in a funk. How do you feel before you repent? Is repentance one of those, oh, I just love finding out that I go to Starbucks less if I get my life right? I just love finding out that whatever, I'm trying to make it light because I don't want to speak for you or your heart. I, but I just want you to know when we're miserable about how things are, we need our misery. You do not, we do not need to make peace with the system that makes its wealth on the backs of the poor. We do not need to make peace with unjust systems. I remember when I thought Tom was lazy. I met Tom. That's not his real name, but he might come to church one day because we still know each other. <clears throat> but I, when I met Tom, I thought he might be lazy. And the reason was when he walked into my church, I recognized him. He was, he was one of those guys that stood on the corner and asked for money. And I had a conclusion in my head about Tom because I recognized him from standing on the corner. What was it? He didn't want a job, was lazy or whatever. I mean, I had it in my head. I just had it. And then I made this big mistake. I got to know Tom, who became Jesus to me. More about that in a minute. The poor can be examples of faithfulness and teach us how to live. The poor can be examples of faithfulness and teach us how to live. You understand this widow gave all she had to live on to a system, and I'm going to say more about it in a minute, but that system was gone by 70 AD. Every one of those people that Gainel read, Jesus said, they will suffer the most. When the Romans came in and took over Jerusalem, when the Romans came in and took over Jerusalem, you know who they murdered and tortured? The people that were heads of the system. The priests. The rabbis, the, the scribes, the people that crucified Jesus in 70 AD were taken over and, the, and the Jerusalem was leveled. And Jesus was telling them, here's how it's going to be. You're going to run a system that's so unjust, and eventually there's going to be a rebellion. There's going to be a way it comes over, and you will be taken down. You cannot mock God. We cannot mock God. God has set the world up. So that if, if the rich get too far from the poor, if you don't make the first last and the last first, if you're not part of that kind of kingdom, which brings people together and all needs become on the table for being met, if you don't work it that way, you will come to an end. The poor can be examples of faithfulness and teach us how to live. I'm telling you, that widow was, was faithful, right? She was taught what? You give sacrificially to the system that you're taught to depend on. And so she did. 
and she gave to the people who stole her house, according to Jesus. Wow. She was not a model in terms of the system she participated in. She was a model in how she participated. She is a model for you and I on how we participate. God asked George Fuller to give everything, to be so committed to the way of the kingdom of God that I would give everything. Follow the widow's example, but do not commit to the systems that will be destroyed, the ones that are unjust. Well, how about the righteous? Do you remember the righteous in the Bible? What do the righteous do? I encourage you to do a word search. It's real easy to do now. Go to Bible Gateway, do a, do a, do a word, righteous, and just read everything about the righteous. What do the righteous do? They take care of the widows and orphans. What do the righteous do? They're good to their neighbors. What do the righteous do? Joy, patience, gentleness, tenderness, self-control. The righteous. God has called us to be righteous. And what happened in the early church when they gave everything and ended up being isolated from their family and, and in many cases, tortured? What did they do? Well, they got together, and guess what they did? They gave everything to each other. So the widow is trusting in her gift, the ones who devour widows' houses. But I just want to tell you that they're, they're doing a lot of research now on why we're, so, why we're the most depressed and anxious we've ever been. Did you know that? We're the most depressed and anxious we've ever been. And even people who have, who have enough money are more anxious and depressed than we've ever been. And they're doing a lot of research. And I would just like to say, like many times, research just tells us what we already know. You know, I just want to say, duh, you know, like, like, didn't we already know that some people are depressed because 80% of people don't like their job? They don't have meaningful work. And they're either working for a wage that isn't enough for themselves and their family, or they're working a job that they can't understand fits into something bigger and better. 80% of people don't like their job. You think that would make you a little bit anxious and depressed? Not only that. People don't believe they have supportive relationships. They're not sure their marriage will make it. They're not sure their family is going to stay together. And lately, families have shouted at each other in the name of a political opinion and de devalued each other because they are not committed to the kingdom of God. They're committed to the survival of a political system. You don't have supportive relationships, people who will be there for you and people you'll be there for. You think that would make you a little depressed and anxious? You know, there are a lot of people who have trauma. In fact, there's a correlation, not an exact correlation, between those of us who are overweight and who had childhood trauma. And since you can't talk about it in your system, in your family system, the reason you're anxious and, and depressed and oftentimes eating to, to soothe your anxiety and your depression and becoming overweight and disconnected from other people is because you had childhood trauma that your family could never help you process. Another reason is that you don't have values that you're worth your life. You're being told that you are only valuable based on how much money you make and buying the right things. And you as a human in your brain know that's just not true. I think the most important things you do don't cost money. I'm weird like that. And then you say, well, if you don't have values that you could live out and, the whole, and you don't turn on the TV and everybody says, love your neighbor and we'll celebrate your existence. No, it's buy this and maybe you'll be cool enough. So you don't have values? You think it'd make you a little anxious and depressed if you don't have values that are worth your life to live for? And then the thing they're finding out is that a lot of people don't think that they're respected, that they have status anymore. And there are a lot of people right now that are losing status and losing respect, and they just don't like losing status and respect. And because they're losing status and respect, they're anxious and depressed. And I'm like, well, sure. I remember when Fred Thompson beat me out for first chair tuba. In the band, I didn't like it. Made me practice hard. But he ended up first chair. I had a social life. Fred just practiced too. We're friends on Facebook now. I don't know if he's watching. I don't think he does. But 
He was first chair. Way to go, Fred. But when you lose status, you did, it bothers you. And there are people right now who are losing status and respect from people, and they're anxious about it. Another is the disconnection from the natural world. I just got back from sitting in a tree, and I just want you to know, when I was weeping in the tree, I wasn't weeping because I was looking at something sad. I was, I was weeping because I was looking at something that worked. And the world I was going back to was broken. Every tree I saw had everything it needed to be a tree right where it was planted. Every plant I saw had everything it needed to be a plant right where it was sitting. Every one of those squirrels was chirping and running around because there were plenty of acres. Those turkeys that walked by, deer that walked by. I've never killed a doe. I mean, I, I said like I killed it. My friend killed a doe that weighed 170 pounds was, and had lots of fat in it. I just never seen one like that. That that deer was living in a place that had plenty to eat. And I'm coming back to a world where I have neighbors that, that are desperate. And people who have plenty and they hold on to it, including George Floyd. We're disconnected from the natural world because the natural world will tell us some things. If you're healthy in relationship to each other, everybody thrives like you are, as the person you are, not as someone you pretend to be. But it's who you are. Pine tree, pine tree. You're an oak, oak. You're a fern, fern. You're a squirrel, squirrel. Sometimes I'd really like to be a squirrel in a place where there's plenty of acorns because it looks like they have so much fun all the time. And I know they're probably desperate half the time and I'm not aware of it. But I thought it wouldn't be nice just to be a squirrel for a little while. And the other thing that makes people anxious and, and uh, depressed is not having a secure future. They cannot imagine 20 years from now being better than the, the year they're in now. In fact, they feel alone and insecure when they think about the future. I'm going to ask a question. What is the answer to these questions, these things that cause anxiety and depression? The kingdom of God. Not the fake version that steal the widow's houses, but the real versions of the kingdom of God. We were told for a while and are still being told by the pharmaceutical companies that depression and anxiety is a chemical imbalance in the brain, and the way to fix it is to have a prescription. And I'm not right now telling anybody to stop a prescription or that you don't need it. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is what they know is that it's psychosocial more than it is chemical, and that your brain and your body chemistry actually follow the anxiety created by the fact that you don't have meaningful work, supportive relationships, a childhood trauma, can't find values, don't have respect aren't connected to the natural world, and, don't, and, that, and can't think securely about your future. But that actually changes the chemistry in your brain, and you're depressed and anxious. And I want to say, duh. But, you know, that's what they're selling. If the kingdom of God came on earth as, as, in, as it is in heaven, as we just finished praying, I'm telling you there would be less need for narcotics to fix the way we feel. So look at what comes next. I told you we'd end up happy, remember? So here, here we go. Uh, I like being on the team that's on the right track of the right answer, right? Look at what comes next. This is my last point. The faithful transform the world. So let me just go back and just remind you, you know, the people that Jesus said were doing all that terrible stuff that made a victim out of the widow? He said they'd be punished. You know what happened in that generation. And in Mark chapter 13, right after the passage Gainel read, he begins to tell them how this is going to happen. He says, in this generation, before all of you die, this is going to happen. There won't be one stone left on each other. Some people read that passage and think that that's talking about an escape plan that happens later at a, at a literal return and resurrection that's down the path. And plenty of you may believe that. That's fine. It's one of, the, one of the testimonies of the Christian church is that, but that's a very recent one. The people who read this were not thinking about that. They didn't have eschatology. They didn't have heaven. They didn't have hell. We created that much later, but a lot of people don't want to believe that, so it's fine. If there's still a, I, if Jesus comes back literally like some preachers preach, and there's a literal trumpet, and he, that, he's going to take me. I'm just wanting you to know, if you, if you take the people who pray to Jesus ever since they were 14, every day of their life, if you don't take that person, okay. And if you don't take me because I'm wrong, then you never take me. 
You understand? I'm always wrong about something. Some things that really matter and some things that don't, but I'm always wrong about something. But what I think Jesus was saying is very clear. Here's the way it's going to go. You guys have tried to be a military power, and that never was my intention. The promise to Abraham was to be a blessing to all nations, and all nations will be blessed by God through you. Now, not to be a nation. I didn't want you to have a king. Right? Read it. He didn't want him to have a king. He didn't want him to be a nation. He wanted him to be a spiritual people. He wanted them to have a Yahweh, not a temple made of hands. A Yahweh is a temple without you that you do not make by hands. You do not make by doctrine. You don't make by man or woman or anybody. It's God. So those who were trusting in the nation and the false version of God preached by the, by the hierarchy of the Jewish religion in the Jerusalem. Remember, we had a scribe that got it. I did not say the Jews didn't get it. No, no Jew got, had, got it at all. I didn't say that. What I said was the people in charge were missing. Just like today, I believe there are plenty of Christians who get what Jesus is talking about. But there are plenty of people in charge who say, keep the system the way it is. Poor people are lazy, and you don't, you don't do anything to change the system. Trusting a nation, trusting a false version of God, you will not mock God. And Jesus was really clear about that. But then he was really clear on what comes next. There's going to come a day when the Spirit's going to come upon you, and they're going to persecute you. 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 They're going to think they're doing the will of God when they persecute you guys. And that's part of the whole new thing happening. Persecuting you is part of the whole new thing happening. So in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit comes and people from all these nations and all these tongues and tribes are all together. Wow. They start building a community that's based on love. They start building a community based on justice for all inside that community and mercy for everybody inside that community, transformation inside that community. Now back to Tom. So I met Tom. Um, and I, as I got to know Tom, what I found out was that he made a lot of bad choices and he'd been addicted to drugs and he had gotten down to where he just had almost nothing. And somebody came along and told him to go to recovery. And he started going to recovery and building his life back and told him to come to new community church where I was pastor. And they said, go talk to George. And they said, but if you go talk to George, he's not going to help you unless you have a plan. They had to have a plane, and we had a team of people there that would come around folks who wanted to rebuild their life. But what I, what I want to tell you is that Tom gave his life, he, he, he gave his life, committed his life and his will to the care of God. You think things changed then? Yeah, they changed. Does Tom, does Tom have a wife today? Good relationship with his two kids? Yep, yep, yep. Did somebody help him get to meetings and find his way back to, to to functional life? Yes. Did someone help him find a job and then eventually a better job and a better job to where he ended up working for um, Lenovo? Yep. I wish I could say the church did. We helped. I encouraged. He'll say I helped him. But the people that got him to the meetings and found him the job, we're in those rooms of recovery because everybody in the room of recovery is equal and everybody in the rooms of recovery deserve an extra chance. And no one's there. That no one got there by being lazy. They got there by being victims of a lot of things and trauma in their life. They got there by making bad choices. They got there by becoming addicted. They got there by a lot of things. But I can tell you one thing, when you're an addict, you're not lazy. What you'll do to get what you're addicted to is anything that is necessary. Lazy in, is not in the bouquet. Because when you're addicted, you give your, your, at your addiction everything. When you're addicted, you give your addiction everything. I won't make my kids suffer. Yes, you will. I won't lose my job. Yes, you will. I won't end up dead. Yes, you will. Everything. Well, here's the catch and the good news. 
is that Jesus, according to Peter in Acts chapter 2, he is the Lord over Caesar. See the threat here? Lord over Caesar and the Christ over the temple. The Christ, superior to the temple. Lord, he is Lord and Christ. This Jesus you crucified, Peter said, is the Lord and the Christ. And the thing is, if you give Christ everything, it's not an addiction. God is not an addiction. Unjust religion can be an addiction because it gives you power. It feeds your ego. But here we go. This is the good news. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, as I get to the end of this sermon, I was nervous about preaching. When they all made the shift and began to give God everything by choice, freedom of choice, with the consequences of being excommunicated from their family, perhaps being put to death, just like Jesus said, they're going to think they're doing the will of God when they persecute. Here's what Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says. Listen to it. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread, communion, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Can't you see the, you see the irony of it? The people who were learning it were in the temple courts, and eventually the temple courts were whew, gone. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's good news. So I'd just like to tell you, the good news is that all of us get to decide what we give God. And we're all going to give God less than everything, right? Until we learn to give God more of everything. And when we do that, we're coming home. You know who made us? You know who made you? Who made me? God. You know who loves you the most? God. You know who knows how you ought to be living and who you are and how you ought to be talking and acting and loving? And living, God. Who deserves our everything? God. And I just want you to come home. I want to come home. If you wake up feeling like you feel when you're eating with the pigs, and you have this notion that if you go back, you'll just be a mangy servant, I just want you to know how it goes when you come back home to God. Here, put a ring on that thing. Put a robe on the thing. Kill the fatted cat. Time to have a party. I'm sorry the widow gave out everything she had to someone who wasn't going to give her a ring, wasn't going to give her a robe, and wasn't going to throw a party. But I hope by the time she died, she found her way to the, to the birth of a Christian fellowship. Because when you walk into a Christian fellowship, ring, robe, party. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for your love that we don't have to doubt it, but we do, that we can't run away from it, but we try. But right now, begin with me and just help us to see more of the everything we can give you. We can't do it perfectly. That's just not how it goes. But we could say more from our mouths that's in harmony with your love. We could do more with our lives that's in harmony with your love. We could spend our money and give our money more in harmony with your love. We could use our voice and influence to change the systems that are growing on the backs of the poor and the people who are victims. Help us not to be goats and miss out on the fact that Tom and Jesus are the same. Help us to be people who see and care for and minister to the least of these and help us to come home because we know in the midst of that, we will indeed have mutually supportive relationships and values we can be proud of. And we'll have work to, be, to do in the kingdom of God that, that makes us want to get up every day and do your will and love the people like you've called us to love. You're going to give us a secure future. No matter how insecure the world might try to make it, you're going to let us know we're secure. And we're going to help secure life together. Be with the group that's meeting that is searching for 
shaping our future together in Christ. Just help us to know the church we need to be as Wendell Christian Church. And renew your church around the world. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of commitment, Take My Life, 600. To go on record that I am committing to do more of what I see to do that Christ is showing me. And I hope that that is the commitment that we all can make along the way. If there's any commitment that you've made, please make it known to someone who would encourage that commitment to Christ. If you want to talk with me or with one of our elders, you can. We enjoy the fact that we can be together in Christ and encourage our life together. If you would, place one hand on your and be reminded that we are the place where God's image and likeness dwell and the Spirit of God dwells within us and we can have confidence that God's life and love dwell within us and we can come to God as we are. And we can also give our hand to the community. Now go and share the words of encouragement, the actions that support the lives of the people that you love and show them the kingdom of God through your life to the glory of Christ. Amen. Amen. Live eternity. We have the devotion on Wednesday mornings at 7.30, and I want to thank Virginia for covering while I was in the woods and with the grandkids. Uh, 
I had a great time. I'm glad that you, uh, you took care of that so, so well. Also, we have Bible study here and on Zoom. Wednesday's at 1030. Uh, so come and be part of that either way that you want to join it. And I'm making sure that I'm not feeding back here. Uh, yeah. Now, other announcements that we want to make this morning? Anybody have an announcement? Yeah, Gaynell? Okay, we're going to take a picture of this Shaping Our Future Together in Christ group. Great. Sounds good. Anybody else? Got any announcements? Well, it's a joy to be back with you guys. I mean, I didn't really miss the Sunday, but I knew I was away. You, you didn't look a bit like a dogwood, um, the things that I was staring at. Uh, so glad you're here. Y'all have a great week.